UFC Vegas 89. We're going to break down this card in its entirety. And a couple of quick things, guys, I want you to know, I happen to have a 10-unit bet on this card. That's a max bet for me, a 10-unit max bet on this card somewhere. No, I'm not going to give that away in this video. I, mean, I might allude to it. You might be able to, to figure it out. And if you do, drop it down below in the comments. Let everybody else know so they can jump on it. However, you can find that over on patreon.com slash 138MMA. The link is in the description to this. Now, if you don't care what my 10-unit bet is, then that's okay. Let's just watch for the breakdown, and that's all right. Another thing I want to do, I'm going to try to remember to do this. It was requested to me by one of you lovely folks in the comments to put a mark next to the person I'm picking on the board for those that just watch with the subtitles on or whatever and don't necessarily understand the voice that I'm saying. For, the, for those of you that have that, I will try my best to remember that. If I forget, forgive me. But let's get into that first fight. There's tons of them on this card, and they're all going to be great. So we'll see you in the heavyweight division. Muhammad Usman takes on Mick Parkin. Parkin's undefeated still. He's 5-0 in the last five, 8-0 overall. For Usman, 4-1 in the last five fights for him. 10-2 uh, and two on the career, so got a little bit more experience, but not a ton. Uh, for Mick Parkin, we're going to start over there. Decent striker. I like the way he's got forward pressure and power. Picks his shots pretty well, but I don't like that he throws pretty much exclusively single shots. Every now and then there's a second one behind it, but a lot of times single shots. But the power, the pressure, picking the spots, I do like that. In the grappling, I do think he's a better grappler than he is striker. He's got good top control, good ground and pound. But to get the fight to the mat, it's kind of a good and bad sort of situation where he can often get the fight there, but he's got to use a lot of strength to do it. He tried to pull guys down, muscle them to the mat, and that's not exactly what you want to do against a guy as strong and freakishly athletic as Muhammad Usman, because as you see, I got the guy labeled as a super athlete. That's what he is. He's a decent striker, and by decent striker, I mean he's just got really good power. That's about it. He's poor volume, throws exclusively single shots. It's not what you want to see from a striker, but that power kind of makes up for a lot. In the wrestling department, he's got pretty good wrestling, decent takedowns. The cage push is good because he's very strong in this, in this situation. I think this is going to be a rough, boring fight to watch honestly and i do think we're going to see a decision and in that decision i think the person who's going to win the third round which is probably what the judges are going to pay attention to because they seem to be horrible these days is going to be muhammad usman holding him up against the cage and getting the win that way so i'm taking muhammad usman to get the win via decision probably fairly close might give up the first round but i think two and three are going to Usman. so let me know what you think I will see you guys. Excellent matchup here between a couple of undefeated prospects in the flyweight division. Andre Lima takes on Igor Severino. This is a fun one, guys. I really, really can't wait to see both of these guys in the UFC in the flyweight division. These guys are going to do some really fun things. I think both of these guys have a bright future ahead of them. But here we are, two undefeated guys. We're going to find out who gets to move up, who kind of starts to figure out where they're at towards the bottom of the ranks. So Andre Lima, like I said, 5-0 in the last five. He's undefeated. Severino, 5-0 in the last five, undefeated. For Andre Lima, the guy's a good striker. He's going to work the body very well. He's got clean, crisp combinations, an excellent heavy cross, and in addition to that, he's got plenty of power to go right along with it. In the grappling department, he's more of a striker for sure. He does have good grappling, though. Decent takedown defense. He's really good at just staying safe on the mat and doing what he needs to do to get the fight where he needs it to be, which is typically on the feet. Now, for Severino, dude's a good striker as well. He's got good forward pressure. He's going to counter leg kicks very well with a big heavy cross, and that's something that I think he could use in this matchup here. Um, he's got decent power as well, and but occasionally he will start to swing a bit wild on the feet. He can get sucked into a brawl sort of thing. In the grappling department, I think he's a better pure jiu-jitsu player here. He does have solid jiu-jitsu. He's going to chain his submission attempts together fantastically. He's very quick to transition between them. And he has very good top pressure. He also isn't afraid to use ground and pound, and a lot of jiu-jitsu guys don't use ground and pound as often as they should. Severino does a great job with it. This is a good fight. This is a great fight. In fact, I'm going to kick my feet up on the coffee table. I'm going to crack open a nice cold root beer, and I'm going to enjoy this one. And guys, if you like that saying, if that's something that you relate to, you can get yourself a shirt. Yes, you can get the shirt with my, my logo on it, my ugly face. Sure, it's going to start a lot of conversations, but maybe you don't like the tension being drawn to you. We've got the other shirt. The shirt, imagine yourself. It's a generic male kicking his feet up on the coffee table with a root beer in hand and watching some fights. You can get that on the website. It's in the, the link is in the description. It's 138mma.company.site. For those of you who want to know, you can get it there. It's going to be a great time. Now let's pick the winner in this one. I'm going to go with Andre Lima with zero confidence whatsoever because this is going to be a good fight. A couple of guys making their debut. You can't really be super confident in that. And I think both guys are impressive. So I'm going to take Andre Lima by the slightest of margins. 
Let me know what you're having in this one. Let me know if you're going to be cracking open an ice cold root beer with me. And I'll see a couple you guys of prospects time. trying to bring some life to the women's bantamweight division. Montserrat Rendon takes on Daria Selenzinyakova. Selenzinyakova is 4-1 in her last five fights. Her only loss coming to Melissa Dixon on the regional scene prior to the UFC as this is her debut. On the Rendon side, she's 6-0. and oh, Undefeated career, obviously 5-0 and oh in the last five. For Rendon, she is older though, 35 years old at, with only six fights in her pro career. Interesting there, 28 on the Zelenzinyakova side. Now, when we look at these two fighters, a lot of there's going to be a lot of people telling you a lot of things, and I'm going to tell you why they're probably not correct, because they've watched one fight and that's where they're at. But either way, for Zelenzinyakova, she's a good striker. Everybody's going to say this, because it's the gosh darn truth. Girl's got good forward pressure. She's got good volume, good power. And the thing that, that you need to know and that she that to me is the biggest deal she mixes both combinations and single shots. A lot of people, they got good combinations. A lot of people, big power shots solo. This girl puts it together. She'll throw a combination, you know, get in tight, land these combinations, circle off. And then when her opponent tries to come in, boom, hit him with a single shot. And then when they go to cover up for the next, you know, whatever, oh, there's nothing there. And then they're like, wait, what happened? And then she comes in with that combo later. She's, she's really good at mixing those things up, keeping her opponent guessing. And I absolutely love that here. Grappling, good top pressure. Heavy ground and pound. Here's the thing. People are going to tell you she has bad takedown defense because Melissa Dixon was able to get her down, ground and pound her out, and get an early stoppage in a matchup where Zelenzinyakova was winning. Here's the deal, though. Melissa Dixon's going to do that to a lot of women at the Bantamweight division. She's going to be able to do that to a lot of women who she fights in the UFC even. So to say that Zelenzinyakova has bad takedown defense because of that is absurd, okay? I think she's going to be fine in her takedown defense in most matchups. And she's gonna she defends takedowns pretty well. She's got a pretty good sprawl. We've seen it in many of our fights where she gets the hips back, sprawls out, and then she looks to either circle to the top position and start landing her shots or get back to her feet and start in the striking range again. So her takedown defense is good and I will argue with anybody over that. So on the other side, Montserrat Rendon. I was on her last time when she fought Tamiris Vidal, unlike most people who thought Vidal was gonna win for some reason. Vidal's not good, guys. I'm just going to tell you that. Montserrat Rendon. I picked her last time. It was a close fight with Tamiris Vidal. Now, what does that tell you? Uh, she's a decent striker, right? She's got decent volume. The volume's pretty... Actually, the volume's pretty good. And one thing I do really like in her striking is that she tucks her chin and keeps her hands up. That's important because it's hard to just get caught with a big shot on the jaw. if Your chin is tucked and your hands are up, right? She does a good job with that. Problem is, she's willing to move backwards. And that's not good against someone with the striking level as Zelenza Yukova. Now, she does not always move backwards. Sometimes she's going to come forward to try to get into the clinch and use some wrestling. When she does that, she swings wild. She doesn't use that jab. She doesn't use the, like, you know, the clean one-two that she has. Instead, what she's going to do is just swing wild trying to get into the clinch because she doesn't really have a good way to close distance other than throw something wild. And that's unfortunate for her because she does have some other good fundamentals like the defense with the chin tucked and hands up. Now, the problem is she reaches for leg kicks. Now, this is okay because also, we're going to come back to it in a second, but her, her way to get fights to the mat is often by catching kicks. So sometimes that's good. <clears throat> but if you're reaching for leg kicks, especially low, what does that do? Well, that takes your hand from here, which is guarding your face, doing very well with that, clear down here, and it also gets to lower your level. And you're going to get wrecked if you don't catch that kick, especially if somebody times this and starts fainting those low leg kicks after landing a few, and you start doing this. And then you just get kicked in the noggin. And that is a problem for Rendon in this matchup where she's fighting somebody who can do that to her, unlike Tamiris Valdal. Now, in the grappling, like I said, she is good at catching kicks. That is the way she's going to get the fight to the mat. If she does get it to the mat, it's to catch a kick. So if she can catch one of the kicks from Zelenza Yukova, I think she's going to be able to take her down. Do I think she's going to be able to do that consistently? Probably not. But I do think she has that option there. She's good in the cage push. She'll get opponents up against the cage and get double underhooks and just hold them here. And just from there, she's going to start working what she needs to do. She's got both underhooks, using her head to grind, and then she'll maybe land some body shots, but keep it there. So she's good at getting the control with that due to having two underhooks on him. Now, decent takedown defense as well. I don't think Zelens and Yakova shooting takedowns, but if she does. Rendon's probably going to be you know pretty good at keeping on her feet. I don't understand anyone picking Rendon. I think Zelens and Yakova is a very... I won't, I won't say the L word, but I think she's very likely to get this one done. I'm high on her in this matchup. I don't think Rendon is at the, is nearly at the level, whether that be in the striking or the grappling. So Lenza Nikova is the pick. Let me know what you have. And I will Featherweight see. Stephen Wynn takes on Jarno Ahrens. 
Aaron's is two and three in his last five, four and one for Stephen Wynn. That lone loss coming on the Contender Series, one of his many appearances on the Contender Series, uh, which he was there three times. Now, for Jono Aaron's, he kind of came in to fill a spot on a card in uh, France when the UFC just needed somebody to fight, I believe it was William Gomi. So that's that's how he got to the UFC. It worked out for him there. He's now on the chopping block, kind of, sort of, because if he doesn't win this one here, he's kind of in a bad way. Hasn't looked great in the UFC thus far. Let's see if we can turn it around. For Jono Aaron's, the guy's got decent striking. The forward pressure is very good. and I will say he would have better striking, I think, if it wasn't in an MMA setting. I think in just like a kickboxing setting, his striking is probably better. But in an MMA style of, of matchup where there's a lot more the clinch, takedowns, things like that, his striking is just kind of decent. He's got good forward pressure. He's got good kicks to all levels, first off. But you can get those leg kicks pretty hard. You can snap it up to your head. He does a good job there. And he's got decent power to go along with it. Grappling. Decent takedowns, but the takedown defense isn't the best. And I think that's why it kind of brings down his striking rating due to that. Now, on the other side, Stephen Wynn. There's a lot of stuff to really like about Stephen Wynn, but there's, there's a couple of things that just really hold him back from being a top-tier fighter. and okay, Or even a high, high-level fighter. Let's put it that way. So, good striking. He's got a clean one-two. Absolutely beautiful. Kicks to all levels. Keeps steady volume. Nothing super high. Not low, but steady. Always coming out. Counters leg kicks very well with just a heavy cross. And I love to see that. However, uh, he kind of lacks killer instinct. So when he gets guys hurt and say, you know, has that leg kick coming, Aaron hits it, he kind of limp legs it a little bit and then steps through and throws a big heavy cross and drops Aaron's. And he's kind of lets him, you know, recover. He's done that many a time. And that's a problem for Steven Wynn. The lack of killer instinct bothers me and it makes it hard for me to pick him in a lot of matchups. He does have good grappling though. He's very difficult to hold down. He doesn't prefer to grapple, but he has it. He's uh, very difficult to hold down, and he does have them choking arms. You heard me mention it before. The dude's got choking arms, and that's a benefit for him. If he grapples in this matchup, I think he gets it done pretty easily. And the striking, though, I think it's close. I do think it's a close fight. I think Stephen Wynn's probably going to point him out for a decision and get the win that way. So for me, I'm taking Stephen Wynn to get the win, which is a horrible joke. I'm dumb. But... Steven wins the pick. Let me know what you have in this matchup it. here in the Bantamweight division. Cody Gibson takes on Miles Johns. Interesting one here. We got three and two for Cody Gibson. Three one and a no contest for Miles Johns. This is going to be kind of a tricky one to predict because we don't really know what Miles Johns we're going to get. But we're going to break it down the best we can with the information that we do have, and we're going to go from there. For Cody Gibson, he is going to be taller and longer. He's five foot ten with a seventy one inch reach, as opposed to the five seven. 66 inch reach of Miles Johns. That is a significant height and reach advantage for Cody Gibson. However, the age advantage is on the Johns side. He's 29 as opposed to the 36 years of age for Cody Gibson. 36 at Bantamweight is a bit on the older side, so that is something to take note of. Now, we're going to break down the skills of Cody Gibson. He's a good striker. He uses his length very well. His length, uh, what he does there is <clears throat> he sticks that jab at range. He's going to stick those teeps to the body. So if he's going high, it's typically with the jab. If he's going to the body, it's typically with the teeth. And he's using that at range, and he does a darn good job with it. He does have good grappling as well. The wrestling fundamentals are very, very nice. The reason why, let me tell you this. Reason why, the guy is a high school wrestling coach. What do you focus on most when you're a high school wrestling coach? Solid wrestling fundamentals. And by golly, that's what he has. He doesn't have the fanciest wrestling in the world. There are better wrestlers in the UFC, but the fundamentals are sound because he's every day teaching these high school kids good fundamentals that win championships. You know, sure, there's some kids there that have been wrestling since they're four. Those aren't the kids that he's teaching that kind of stuff to. There's the kids that start wrestling in high school because that's what sometimes happens, and he gets a really good level of that fundamental training, and that's what translates well into MMA fights. I know that sounds stupid that you're like, oh, yeah, he works with high schoolers. I understand that sounds dumb, but it's the truth. Anyway, he's a good back taker as well. I mean, he's very active off of his own back. The problem he's had in the past is that his cardio will fade in very high pace fights. Here's the benefit for him. Miles Johns does not typically fight in high pace fights. Miles Johns is a good striker with a ton of power and great counters. The problem is his volume is typically lackluster. He, does, he just looks to pick that shot, waits for his opening, and tries to counter strike. And that is a problem against a guy that has a massive reach over you and that also is going to be using that reach very well. In the wrestling, though, which he prefers not to use, he likes to use his boxing. It's primarily a boxing striking. He does have very good wrestling. He's got good takedowns. He's got very good top control. If he can bank a round or two, 
by wearing on Cody Gibson and staying safe on top, he might be able to sap that cardio. But the problem is, I don't know that he's going to do that because they know he prefers to strike and he looks to counter. And if he waits two rounds, the first two rounds trying to do that, and Gibson put, gets up two rounds and none, and then Johns finally starts to use his wrestling because he's realizing he's down and this isn't working and I need to get the takedown, it's going to be too little too late. For that reason, I'm taking Cody Gibson to get this one done by decision. I think he's going to be able to outpoint him. I think he's going to be able to stay at range, pump that jab, work those teeps to the body, and stay safe enough and not get taken down using those solid wrestling fundamentals, like I said. So Cody Gibson's the pick. I've got to get my mark out. There it is. Good job. Let me know what you have, and I will see you guys in the next fight. Folks, he's back. The man, Juicy J, Julian Arosa, my favorite fighter. If you've been around the channel for a while, you know Julian Arosa is my guy, favorite fighter in the UFC. With that said, I am as biased as it can get in this prediction. So I'm not even allowing myself to bet on this fight. Take what I say as, you know, do your own research on this one. I'm going to tell you what I know and tell you all this, but I'm biased as heck. And I can tell you ahead of time, I've already taken Julian Arosa. I don't even have to tell. I don't care who he's fighting. The guy could be fighting anybody. He'd be fighting Elliot Deporia, and I'd be taking Julian Arosa because that's my freaking guy, favorite fighter ever. But let's break this down, right? So Julian Arosa, he's 3-2 and two in his last five fights. Yeah, he's had a couple of bad spots lately, but that's okay. He's going to bounce back right here when he puts out Ricardo Hamos. Now, for, uh, for Hamos, Ramos, Hamos, whatever. For Hamos, two and three in his last five. He's going to be the shorter fighter with a shorter reach. Hamos is 5'9", 72-inch reach, 6'1", 74.5-inch reach for Arosa. Now, here's the thing. Let me tell you how this is going to go down. Arosa is going to come out. He's going to tuck his chin. He's going to have his hands here. He's going to walk him down just like this. And then when he gets up to him, he's going to start swinging these big bombs like this, getting Ramos to back up against the cage because that's what you do when you got Julian Arosa tucking the chin and swinging bombs at you, backing you up. And Arosa, as he's starting to get him backed up, he's probably going to crash the, the distance with a with a flying knee, right? He's going to do that to, to, to just, you know, when he's got him pinned, just obliterate him. But he's going to be tough. He's going to handle that knee. And he's going to start trying to swing back. And he's going to get clipped with one. And he's going to say, oh, screw that. I'm shooting a takedown. He's going to try and shoot a takedown. Julian Arosa is going to get them hips back, sprawl out, catch him with the Dars choke, and put him to sleep. Julian Arosa is getting this one done. But we're going to break it down on the skills. Uh, Julian Rosa, good striker. Forward pressure is there. Like I just told you, he's got volume and power. Like I just told you, punches come from all angles, especially just big ones like that. And he's got that flying knee to crash the pocket, like I said. But the problem is, when he starts doing that, his hands start getting low because he starts flinging these bombs like this. That is a problem for him, but it doesn't matter. He's still going to get this one done. Good grappling as well. The front chokes, like I said, and he's got that sprawl to set it up. Dude's got choking arms. He can often get takedowns of his own as well. He uses his striking pressure to get folks against the cage. Once he gets them against the cage, that's when he takes their legs, pulls them out from under them, puts them on their butt. And he's got cardio to do this for an entire three rounds. If not five, he can do it all night. Julian Rosa is a man. Anyway, <laughs> uh, for Hamos, dude's a good striker as well. He's got a very diverse attack on the feet. He does spin a bit too much, and I think that could be a problem for him here. But that spinning elbow is pretty good. On the other hand, he's grappling. He's got very good timing on his takedowns. I don't think it's going to work for him here, but he does have very good timing on his takedowns. Good back taker as well, but if he gets on his back, he can be stuck there. Guys, you know it, Julian Arosa. Most of you have probably already skipped to the next fight, but those of you that have stuck around, Julian Arosa is the freaking man. Thanks for checking this one out. I'll see you guys in the next one. one at Lightweight, folks, and if you haven't done it yet, if you're enjoying this video, maybe you've learned a thing or two, do me a solid. Like this video and show me that, that you're enjoying yourselves. I do appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. It's amazing that these videos will get, like, you know, over a thousand views and around a hundred likes. So that makes me think that 900 plus people just don't enjoy this, their time here. So that's very strange, but they watch every week. So there is that. Either way, we're going to break down this fight. Kurt Hollibaugh takes on Trey Ogden. Uh, Hollibaugh three and two in his last five fights. That does not include the ultimate fighter. I didn't want to do all the math and put that up there. I did it last time he fought. You get it now. That's not include the ultimate fighter um, for the, the exhibition matches anyway. Uh, for Trey Ogden, 2 2 in a no contest. The no contest should be a win. He should be 3 and 2. Both of these guys should be 3 and 2. Either way, this matchup here is a good one. I like this. Uh, I like this. I like the matchmaking that was done here. Let's put it that way. I think both of these guys have kind of, they're kind of dark horses, right? Nobody really looks at them as, as like, ah, yeah, they're, 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 you know, like they're, they're solid prospects. Nobody looks at that because they're kind of older guys. They, uh, you know, kind of keep overperforming to what people, what the, the fans think. Uh, for Kurt Hollibaugh, dude's a solid striker. He comes in, he's got good footwork, long, rangy jab. 
He's got good countering ability, and he's got good combinations, especially as he's coming forward with those combos. And he throws them with vicious intent. Uh, for Hollabaugh, he, he he just comes in there ready to roll, and he does not care if he gets taken down because of it, because his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is also excellent. He stays safe on top, and he's got good ground and pound. But if he's off his back, he's almost even more dangerous because he's very good at looking up for the, looking for those submissions, especially the triangle. And we've seen it a lot lately on the Ultimate Fighter in that finale matchup. The dude has very good weapons from his back as well as on top. And he's not a guy that if, if they're on their back, I'm like, come on, dude, just try to get up. Stop trying to throw stuff up. If he's throwing stuff up, it's a real threat. He finished. He's finished 17 of his 20 wins, and that is incredibly impressive. And he finishes pretty much everything. Uh, in recent memory. So for Kurt Holobaugh, a lot of skills. Yes, you don't really like a guy that's content to stay on his back. That is a problem. I should have wrote a negative there. I didn't, whatever. But I do like a lot of the rest. Now, for Trey Ogden, dude's a good striker as well. It's improved lately. Uh, showed that in the Nikos Mata fight, which he should have won, but they gave him no contest, whatever. Dude's got a nice jab, good volume, and he keeps a high guard. And that's something that you really want to see when you got somebody like Holobaugh trying to walk you down. He's going to keep that high guard. He's going to land leg, leg kicks, and he does pretty well with those. So the leg kicks are good. The, the jab's good. Decent volume there. Uh, in the grappling, he's got very good takedown entries, and I think he's going to be able to get Hollabot to the mat if he wants him there. I don't know that he does, but if he does want him there, I think he's going to be able to get him there. He, he does seem to be a bit of a choking specialist, which that sounds very strange, but he does go for the chokes. That seems to be what he looks for on the mat. He doesn't look for the arms and look for the legs. He looks for the chokes. That is what he's going for, whether that be a head and arm choke, whether that be rear naked choke, something like that. He's looking for the neck. That's what he's trying to attack. So in this one here, I feel pretty good about this one. Kurt Hallbaugh's getting the finish. Uh, I don't think that's crazy to say. 17 to 20 wins have come by finish. I don't think that's crazy to say. I think Kurt Hallbaugh's a better fighter here. Yes, he could get stuck on his back and Trey Ogden stays safe. He could cruise his way to a decision. But I really do think Kurt Hallbaugh is getting it done. I don't know if he's knocking him out or if he's submitting him. Kind of depends where the fight goes. But I think he's better everywhere. And that's what I'm. What I. What makes me want to pick a fighter in a matchup? So Kurt Hallbaugh's the pick. Let me know what you have, and I will see you guys. Featherweights, and what seems to be the front runner, in my opinion, for the fight of the night. We have Fernando Padilla taking on Luis Pajuelo. I think is how you say that, Pajuelo. So I'm gonna go with that. So for Pajuelo, he is five and zero in his last five fights. Padilla three and two. Now Padilla is gonna have a massive height and reach advantage in this one. He's six one with a seventy six inch reach, and for Pajuelo. Pa, or Pajuel, Pajuelo, I think that's how you say it, Pajuelo. He's got he's 5'10 with a 69 and a half inch reach. For anybody that's better at Spanish than I am, let me know how close I am with that Pajuelo uh, saying, all right? Or that or the pronunciation. Anyway, so for Padilla, Padilla's a fast starter. He's got good volume, good striking overall. He's very accurate, and he likes to counter strike as he comes forward, which is a difficult thing to do because you're not only coming forward with pressure, but then you're countering. So as you're closing the distance, instead of waiting for your opponent to come into that 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 danger zone per se, and then countering, he'll come forward and do it. And he can do that because he's so accurate with his strikes and he has such a good volume that he can force opponents to, to make mistakes, right? Now in the grappling, dude is great on the ground. He's very good off of his back. He has a very very uh, tight triangle and, and arm bar sequence that he can go to, whether it's triangle to arm bar, arm bar to triangle, whatever, and you se seamlessly go back and forth. But the problem is, his open mat takedowns are a bit lacking, and he doesn't really have the ability to get the fight to the mat when he wants it there a lot of the time. Now, he's going up against Luis Pajuelo, who, good striker in his own right. He's got good forward pressure, probably the better forward pressure of the two. Great volume. His striking defense isn't the best, but he's durable. He can eat shots and just keep coming forward and just attacking with an endless onslaught. Now, the thing is, he's very hard to control on the mat. So if you do end up getting him to the mat, he bounces right back to his feet, and he does a good job with that. And he makes guys start shooting desperate takedowns because he sets such a such a high pace. This is the definition of a of a feet on the coffee table, crack open a root beer style fight. Because I'm not I'm not going to be betting this one. I want to stay away from this one as far away as I can because there's a lot of unknowns in this matchup, and there's a lot of a lot of tricky spots on this card. This is probably one of the trickiest. So for real, I'm just going to watch, but I will give you a pick for the sake of the video. And with that said, I think Luis Pajuelo is the choice that I've got to make. The reason why, I think he's going to have the better pressure. I think he's going to be able to get Padilla to go on the back foot, which is not where he wants to be. And I think he's going to be able to land the, uh, the more impactful shots in the eyes of the judges. And he's going to be able to stay conscious throughout, throughout 15 minutes. So for me, Pajuelo is the pick. 
Let me know what you have, and let me know if my pronunciation is all right in the comments below. It's time for the featherweights. Billy Q takes on the returning Yusuf Zalal. Zalal is 3-1 and, and a draw, actually, in the last five fights. 3-2 and two for Quarantillo. Quarantillo? 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 Depends if you're, you know, depends of what ethnicity you are when you hit the, how you say that. Uh, Billy Q is the older fighter at 35 years old, which is getting up there for featherweight. Uh, Zalal is only 27, making his return to the UFC at a Good age leading right into his prime. He's not quite there yet, but he's still, still improving leading into that. For Zalal, he's a good striker with good movement. He can fight out of either stance. He doesn't really get hit very often, but he doesn't have a ton of volume. Offensively, though, he does have very good step in knees, and he can change that into a flying knee when need be. That's probably his best, like, most dangerous weapon, and the, the thing that he could use to probably drop Billy Q in this fight is that step in or flying knee. However, he doesn't have a ton of volume, like I said. So the volume is going to go on the Billy Q side. We're going to cover that more in a moment. Now, for Zalal, dude's got good grappling as well. He's got decent takedowns. The only problem is he shoots them from too far out most of the time. So you can see them coming. So if you've got decent takedown defense whatsoever, you'll know that they're coming and you'll be able to get to your defenses before he gets in. Um, he does have a really good ability to reverse position when on the mat. And he's, he's able to fight out of submissions extremely well. If you watch the fight with Ilya Taburia, the way that Zalal was able to fight out of some of those submissions was incredible. So Yusuf Zalal is safe on the mat, good at reversing position, which he did to Taporia multiple times. Um, but the problem is, like I said, getting the takedown is a struggle if you're shooting it from too far away. However, maybe he won't be shooting it from too far away because he's got Billy Q on the other hand, who's going to come forward with a ton of volume. He's going to... He's just going to put combinations of punches and kicks together, and he's just going to try to walk through whatever punches you're throwing at him and use that striking to get in tight and then either grapple you or continue to strike with you or just take the fight wherever it goes, but put chaos in your face, and that's what he's trying to do. When it gets to the grappling, he's good there as well. He's very good in the scrambles. He's got good volume on the ground and pound. Now, yes, he can be taken down, but he can reverse position. He can get back to his feet. He can scramble. He can create those scrambles from just the fact that he never really stops doing something. His pace and cardio being his biggest weapon, and I think that's what's going to get him the, the nod here on the judges' scorecards. Billy Q is my choice to get this one done, and I think the reason why is, like I said, he's going to be able to just do more in the matchup. And I understand Yusuf Zalal is a very skilled fighter, but taking this fight is on short notice for him. He is taking this fight short notice to get back into the ufc it gets a very very tricky matchup so billy q's my pick let me know what you have and i wouldn't fault you for picking zola i'll see you guys in prospect the versus prospect showcase here where cameron simon takes on peyton talbot in the bantamweight division love this matchup this is gonna be a very fun one i'm almost sad that somebody's got to lose because i'd like to see both of these guys get to move up the ladder but i do like that we get to find out who the prospect is at this point in their careers so for Cameron Simon, he's 4-1 in his last five. He did lose his last matchup to Christian Rodriguez. That's kind of what Christian Rodriguez has been doing lately. He's just taking people's O's. So good thing for Peyton Talbot. This isn't Christian Rodriguez because we know how that's going to go, whether you win or lose the fight. Now, for Peyton Talbot, he is 5-0 and in his last five fights. He's got that 7-0 and record, that nice shiny zero in the loss column. We'll see if he keeps it after this matchup. In this one, Cameron Simon, he's a good striker, good volume, plenty of power for the Pan and Weight division. He's got leg kicks that he works to accumulation. We're going to touch on that a little bit more when we get to the Talbot side. But he does have uh, leg kicks that he works to accumulation. What does that mean? That means he starts with the leg kick early, and he keeps doing it throughout the fight until that starts to wear on the opponent where they can't put that weight on the foot or, they, or on the leg and where they can't, uh, they can't plant the same that they did before. He's just going to keep working that through the whole fight. He's got good combinations, and the knees up the middle are some of his better, better weapons on the feet. His problem is he's kind of open to counters because he sticks around after his combinations. Maybe it's to admire his work. Maybe he just doesn't have the urgency to get back out because he thought his opponent would be down and they weren't. But he'll go in and land his combination or whatever. And then he, instead of just darting back out or, you know, going into a clinch or something like that, he'll stick around in the pocket and not have anything coming at the opponent. And that's where he can be caught. In the grappling department, his wrestling is pretty good. And he mixes in the takedowns in striking exchanges. So it's, you know, it's like he throws his little combination or whatever what you, and then it's right there. Oh, drop, change levels, get that takedown. He does that very well, and that's something that I think he can take advantage of in this matchup. He's got good scrambles on the ground as well. His pacing is great, and I do think that he is still, he still gets the moniker of a dirty fighter. Yes, he did not cheat in his last matchup. Christian Rodriguez beat him to it by missing weight. However, he's done it in quite a few matchups where he's had points taken or just heavily warned, what have you. 
So he still gets the Dirty Fighter moniker, which is mostly a positive, but it technically can lead to getting a point taken, and it can lead to disqualification. But typically it's a positive, so I put it as a plus minus. On the other side, Peyton Talbot. Dude's a good striker as well. He's got very good forward pressure, and in fact, that pressure is what breaks opponents. Dude just comes forward and just walks them down with volume, power, uses it all. He's got good knees mid combination. What does that mean? He'd be throwing punches here and then throw a, a knee and then use it as a step through to another combination or part of the combination. Whatever. He can just put the knees in the middle of a combo, which is not something a lot of people do. They can start a combo with knees or they can end a combo with knees. Not many can, people can put it in the middle of a combination, and Talbot does that well. His biggest problem, though, striking defense isn't there and the leg kick defense isn't there. We talked about this a little bit, right? We talked about it. I've been using my, ah, whatever. It's going to work. Works leg kicks to accumulation. Dude's got bad leg kick defense. That's a problem for Peyton Talbot. However, the dude's a terminator. This guy just takes whatever's coming at him and just goes through it. I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me. He's a terminator. Like sent from Cyberdyne Systems back from the future to, to get rid of John Connor. And here he is. He's now being a Terminator in the UFC. That's what he does. That reference is extremely dated. So all you old people are going to get that. All you young folks have no idea what I'm talking about. He does have yeah, fairly porous takedown defense, but he does bounce right back to his feet in most instances. Uh, Nick Aguirre was able to get him down and hold him down for a little bit, but it wasn't like he was able just to continue to control him on the mat. Talbot was able to get to reverse position at one point, get his own top control and land his own shots. Um, so, yes, he typically bounces right back up. And the dude seems to have cardio for days. For me in this matchup, I struggle with this one because I do think that there's a lot of things that could be beneficial for either side, right? The leg kicks to accumulation, for example. I love that for, for the uh, Cameron Simon side. The fact that the dude's a Terminator and just breaks guys with his pressure. It's similar to kind of what happened to Cameron Simon against, against uh, Christian Rodriguez. It's not exactly the same, but it's similar, right? The guy that just kept coming and just kept putting it on him. He was able to beat him that way. So for me, it's tricky. I'm going to take Talbot, and I don't feel great about it, I don't, but I don't even – we've seen him eat leg kicks before, and it didn't seem to really slow him up. So I'm going to take Talbot to be able to eat the leg kicks, be able to eat the shots coming from Simon, and just eventually just overwhelm him with volume and power and get the win that way, whether it be via decision or a late finish. But I'm taking Peyton Talbot. Let me know what you have, and I will see you guys – there's the mark in the net. We've got a couple of middleweights that I kind of don't really know how good of a read I have on these guys because I struggle to really understand them and their their skills and all that in the same way I do other fighters. I don't I know that doesn't make a lot of sense because you'd think like you could just look at every fighter and know you know be able to get that same. I don't have a good read on either of these guys, and I've I've struggled to really. I've struggled to take their skill set and comprehend it in a way that makes sense in my head. I know that sounds weird to say, but just take everything I say in this one with a grain of salt. Now, in this one here, Edmund Shabazi, and he's one in four in his last five fights. He's lost to some really, you know, higher level guys in the division. But where is he at now, right? Has that messed up his confidence? Has that, you know, maybe we found out his floor was uh, was was pretty low and his ceiling was kind of mid tier. Right? Maybe that's what we figured out. Or for AG Dobson, though, similar kind of style. Like when he first came in, he's three and two in his last five, sure. But when he first came into the UFC, the guy was like, you know, looked at as a pretty good prospect. And then he drops a couple of fights. Sure, he's only seven and two on the career, but then he drops a couple of fights, right? So I don't really know where these guys are. And I think, I think that's fair to say that most people kind of struggle to figure out where exactly these guys are. I'm going to do my best here. So let's break it down. AJ Dobson, he's a good striker. Um, his volume isn't good. Like, he usually just kind of waits too much. But he's very fast when he does strike, and he does have good striking defense. And if he lands, he's very powerful. These are the things I've got for him, right? There's not a lot there, and there's it, I just don't have a ton to go off of. Uh, his wrestling's pretty good. He's good at catching kicks. That's that's a, a good way for him to get the fight to the mat in this particular matchup because Shabazian's a kicker. Um, and he's also very good in the scrambles. Now, when we look at Shabazian, like I said, he's a kicker. He's a solid striker in general with pretty good power, potentially um, getting a knockout from a kick. Could get that kick caught. That's something that, you know, something to look at. He's got decent wrestling. His takedowns are all right uh, offensively. His cage push is pretty good, but he struggles massively off of his back. Now, if he can get the fight in the clinch, he does a good job, right? He's got pretty good judo kind of style uh, in the clinch, but he does struggle if he gets taken down and his back is put on the mat. Another thing we've seen is his cardio fade especially in higher pace fights. Now, I don't think Dobson's going to put out a high pace, 
because the dude struggles with volume. But in the event that he does or is able to get a takedown off of maybe a caught kick, for example, Shabazian's cardio is going to start to sap. Now, this is going to be a tough one for me to call. I would pass on this fight, but I, like I said, I saw him a good read. I'm going to take AJ Dobson for nothing other than I just four and one or one and four in the last five is just a horrible bit of momentum. So there is momentum on the Dobson side with him, you know, coming off of a win, looking all right in his, you know, in his last five fights, even though he's got a couple of losses. And I think after a while, if you're just losing, losing, and losing, your losses, they, they start to become a habit. My coach used to always tell me that. He would say that losing becomes a habit. And it messes you up mentally. So I'm going to take Dobson because I think his head's in it. And I feel like if he can catch a kick and get the fight to the mat, he's got a significant advantage. That's where I'm at. Let me know what you have, and I will see you guys. We got the big boys of the heavyweight division. Justin Taffa takes on Carl Williams. Interesting one here because we all know how this went down. Justin Taffa was scheduled to fight a while back. He got hurt while in the back. And uh, his brother, who was there to corner him, Junior Taffa, stepped in to take the spot in that matchup. Well, now Carl Williams was slated to fight Junior Taffa in this matchup originally. And then since Justin Taffa did the old twin swap last time, now Justin is fighting Carl here. I understand they're not actually twins, but you get what I'm saying. So now Justin jumps in to fight Carl Williams instead of Junior Taffa. So they just switch places. And uh, here we are, right? So Justin Taffa, he's a big boy. He's got... Three one and one no contest that I poked from Austin Lane being the one no contest. He's a thick guy who has missed weight at heavyweight before, but he's gonna be the smaller guy as far as height and reach in this matchup. On the other side, Carl Williams, five and zero in the last five fights. He's looked very impressive thus far. He's the much bigger guy in this matchup. Carl Williams, six three with a seventy nine inch reach, six foot with a seventy four inch reach for Tafa. Now, if you notice, I don't have anything about the grappling of Tafa. He doesn't really grapple, and nobody really has tried to grapple him hardly at all. And so we don't really know a ton about Tafa's gra grappling that we're not just speculating, uh, at least at the UFC level. I, you might be able to find a little bit out there somewhere, but I don't really have a whole lot to say about his grappling. So we're going to go on the striking here. And he's a good striker. He's got power. He's going to work the body. He's going to work the leg kicks. And those things are, are, you know, right there. You're already hitting all three levels because you know he's a headhunter with that power. He's knocking guys dead. Uh, he's got good countering ability, which you don't really think, see that in a big, heavy, uh, big heavyweight you know, power puncher, right? But he does have it. And he's also durable. So if he has to eat a shot and then counter back, he can do that. Now we've seen him slow down as fights go on in the past. That is not his best weapon. And he's fighting a guy in Carl Williams, who, solid wrestler, has very good takedown entries because they're quick. For a heavyweight, they're very quick, right? Now compared to a, a you know, like a flyweight, they're probably not quick. But for a heavyweight, Carl Williams has very quick takedown entries and he does a good job with it. He's got good top control once he gets there, especially for guys that at the heavyweight division, often have a hard time getting back to their feet. He's got a clean jab and plenty of power in his hands as well. Obviously not as much as, as Tafa, but he does have enough power to sting you and hurt you, especially with that long rangey jab at 79 inch in the wingspan. That's going to help him out a bit. And I do think he's going to have a pretty significant cardio advantage in this one. So for me, in this matchup, I think I have to take Carl Williams, and I'm going to do so. Taking Carl Williams to get this one done, maybe decision, maybe late finish. I don't really know for sure. But I like Carl Williams. Oh, almost forgot to mark this one. I'm taking Carl Williams to get it done because I think Justin Taffa has to get the, the knockout early, and I, I can't bank on that. So we're taking Carl Williams. Let me know what you have, and I'll see you in the next one. All right, folks, it is the main event of the evening, and I want to give you a little bit of information here about the notes. I've had to shorten these to put them on the board because if I put all of them on the board, you wouldn't be able to read them. So a little reminder, you can find my full notes, my full Every bit of notes that I put on this card are going to be on patreon.com slash 138MMA. That's where you can find those. And in fact, you can actually find that 10-unit bet I talked about over at patreon.com slash 138MMA as well. That link is in the description. Let's break down this fight. We have a couple of strawweights fighting up at flyweight. Rose Namajunas takes on Amanda Hebos. Both of these ladies are 3-2 and two in their last five fights. And they both happen to be at flyweight whilst being natural strawweights, at least from what I can tell. Uh, for Rose Namajunas, she is solid everywhere. Solid grappling. She has good takedowns. Very good timing on her entries. Now, she also has the, the ability to use a uh, traditional takedown, you know, like a single or a double leg. Or she's got good trips, whether that be from the body lock or from the tie clinch. She can trip you from either spot. She's got the good, she's got good, you know, traditional style takedowns. Basically, if she wants to get the fight to the mat, she has the tools to do so. In the defense of that, she does have a good sprawl as well, so she's pretty good at defending takedowns. 
when she gets to fight to the mat, she's got a couple options. She can look for a submission or a ground and pound. That's like most people, but she's good at both. If she's going the ground and pound option, she's got good volume and uses her elbows as one of her primary weapons in the ground and pound, whether that be from the top or if she happens to be off of her back, using those elbows to split her opponents open. She also has good transitions. She's very good at taking the back and looking for the rear naked choke. Yes, she has other moves on the ground, but that rear naked choke happens to be one of her best submissions, and I would say it's probably her best submission. Uh, in the striking department, she's got good footwork. She puts together good combinations, and while she's doing that, she's setting it up with feints and moving her head the whole time. She always stays stays light on the toes, moving around, dancing back and forth. A couple of fights, that's all she did, and that's not good, but most fights, she's very, very skilled at setting up her combinations, and her two best weapons on the feet, if you ask me, are her lead hook and her head kick. Those are the two weapons that I think she can put together um, and use on the feet here to maybe land some good shots. But Rose Namajunas sometimes just doesn't show up. We've seen that. It's kind of like I mentioned where sometimes all she does is that movement and doesn't really do a lot. That is the problem for Namajunas. Out of those six losses, a lot of them came from that. Not all of them. A lot of them come from the uh, just not quite being there in the right headspace. And that is a problem for her. And that makes it tough to pick her as a big heavy favorite in any matchup. On the other side... We got Amanda Hebos. Amanda Hebos is a very skilled striker as well. She's a very skilled grappler as well. I would say the grappling is probably her best weapon. I don't think anybody would disagree. She's a solid jujitsu player, solid with the judo. Um, she's got good. Um, she's got good hip tosses, basically the judo style hip throws, where she gets that hip underneath and uses that to elevate her opponents and toss them over. That's probably her best way to take down. But she can also get onto the body lock and look for the trip there. She's got good top pressure when she does get the fight to the mat. And from there, she's got very slick transitions. She's hard to take down herself. In fact, a lot of people, if they want to get her to the mat, they either need her to do the do the, the taking down or they need to knock her down. Uh, in her striking, though, she would be great if she could just be a little more defensive. Uh, her, her volume is there. She's got a really good slip and counter style, which I love. I, that was sloppy as heck, but she does it better than I just did trying to do that while also looking at the camera. But she has a very good slip and counter style. It's fantastic against rows that might be tough. But she does mix up her striking levels, where she'll go legs, body, head, doesn't matter. She'll, she'll mix those up, and she does a fantastic job with it. But the problem is her striking defense leaves her wide open for a lot of shots, especially when she's trying to slip these shots and not block them. Now, I understand slipping is better than blocking because you don't have to eat any of it, but you want to be doing both, right? You don't want to slip and just leave your face wide open. You want to you want to slip and keep keep that tight. Now, for, for uh, uh, Hebos, Sometimes the, the keeping the, the, the guard up is it gets to be a lacking. She counts too much on that head movement. So for me, when I look at this matchup, it's a tricky one. And it's basically what it comes down to is right here. Because for me, I've got to go with Rose Namajunas. But I couldn't bet a Rose Namajunas at over minus 200 for the simple fact that we just don't know where she's at, whether she's going to show up or whatnot. But I am going to take Rose Namuses in this matchup. And I'm going to take her to probably win this one at some point via TKO. But I'm not super confident, confident in it. So for me, I'm just going to kick back, put my feet up on the coffee table, crack open a nice cold root beer, and enjoy this main event and see where these ladies are at. But let me know what you think down below. I appreciate you all tuning in. Don't forget to like the video on your way out. And I will see you all very soon.